there are two versions of this video. The chaise long version, which you're watching right now, and a somewhat shorter version over on the main channel. So if you want a more concise version of this video, head over there. Otherwise, stay here while I relax. When it comes to building an EV, automakers have done it a variety of different ways. There's the option that takes the least amount of effort. That is putting a battery and motors into an existing gas car. The Fiat 500e, the original one, and the Chevy Spark spring to mind, although Nikki used to own a Volkswagen City Stromer, which also fits this category. And you can build a perfectly good, well, an okay EV that way. EVs have so much torque and their power delivery is so smooth that even in a less than ideal use case, the car can be pretty fun. Then there's automakers like Tesla who have gone all out. They've designed bespoke architecture that is entirely designed around being an EV. It means you can take advantage of all the things that EVs do well. And you can also package those things so that you get a better utilization of space. And then there's the middle path, making a new platform that uses both electric and traditional ICE engines, something that Hyundai Kia have been well known for. The Nero and the Nero EV are based on the EcoCar platform. The Hyundai Kona is based on the i30 platform and they share a drivetrain. Those vehicles allow you to do something that produces a really pretty good EV, but it still has a ton of compromises. The interior space is a little more challenging to organize and you're still beholden to fitting a gas engine up front. So what happens when an automaker that is known for doing that, that is known for getting the best out of those kinds of platforms, designs a bespoke architecture? What happens when they build this? This is the Ionic 5, and this is our first drive. Okay, so we have to talk a little bit about the design, because when I first saw this and it was a concept, I was like, they are, you know, no way Hyundai are gonna build that. That is ridiculous. And here it is in the flesh, and it looks pretty much exactly the same as the concept. I mean, the interior, much more not concepty, but the outside, is amazing. These slashes, I just simply adore them. If you're going to have plastic body panels, then let's make use of them. I love these stripes down the side here, these slashes cut into it. This clamshell hood, I mean, I have slight qualms about pedestrian safety in this edge here because, you know, ER nurse, but it is just delightful to look at and so sharp. Over here, there is this little black line which actually carries on on the back of the car which is phenomenal and the pixel lights front and rear i i know i know i shouldn't really be quite so excited because it, it just kind of speaks to me it's like someone went to my childhood and went this is what a car looks like and i went yeah that's exactly what a car looks like there are some things about it which I'm not quite so fond of, both about the way the user interface works and the way the vehicle drives. It's very good, but it's not my favourite. However, that said, this is a vehicle that is intended not exactly for me. It's a mid-segment car with pretensions, and that's not a bad thing because the interior is delightful, but it does mean it's not for me exactly. It is really a beautiful vehicle. And I unreservedly say that I actually really like it in person. I thought I would, and I do. Well done, Hyundai, well done. You reached into my brain and pulled out what I wanted. So outside of the styling, let's talk about the rest of the vehicle. Underneath, it has a 77.4 kilowatt hour usable battery pack from SK Innovation. That is specific to the US model and does mean that you get a smaller front trunk, which is very small. You get 22 and a half liters or 
0.8 cubic feet. Not much. I mean, I, I can put my book in there. That's nice. Good for charging cables. Not really much use for anything else. In the rear wheel drive model, you get 225 horsepower. That's 168 kilowatts. And the all wheel drive model produces 320 horsepower with 74 kilowatts up front and 165 kilowatts at the rear. Both of those are plenty. And to be honest, the 5.1 second all wheel drive zero to 60 time is very reasonable. It can actually disconnect that front motor if you need to extend your range. So if you put this in eco mode and you have the all wheel drive model, it will disconnect that front motor and increase its economy. And let me tell you, when we get to driving it some more, it needs it. So it is 182 and a half inches long, which is four and a half meters. And it is 74 and a half inches wide, which is 1.9 meters roughly. And that is pretty big, but it doesn't really feel it. It certainly does feel a little heavy when you push it, but today I am lucky enough to be driving the all wheel drive. So it never lost it when I was driving, but we'll talk more about driving when I'm driving. It is a 118.1 inch wheelbase. That's three meters long. And it is the longest wheelbase I think that Hyundai have. It's certainly very long and it does the four wheels in the corner kind of thing, which really helps with the handling and also helps with this interior space. Up front, you get about 106 cubic feet of cabin space. That's about 3000 cubic liters and then up at the back in the trunk, you get a full 27.2 cubic feet. That is 59.3 cubic feet of space once you fold down the rear seats. Those rear seats are adjustable. And in here you have bio-based materials. So they said there's very little petrochemical material that you come into contact with. Uh, the roof here is a bio-based uh, plastic and the same for various other materials. I have said a lot about, you know, hating the concept of the interior as a lounge, but you know, when you can just relax with the push of a switch, no, still, I hate the concept, but it is actually very nice in here. Up front, there is a 12 inch instrument cluster and a 12 inch infotainment screen. Neither of these are shaded at all. And Hyundai said that they've managed to make the screen so bright that you don't need shading. I haven't had any problems with visibility and it is, as you can see, extremely bright today. The HUD, however, I have had a few difficulties seeing. It does in the higher spec models. I think in the limited edition, um, it has a HUD, which is allegedly focused so that you can see it without having to adjust your depth perception, which is obviously one of the big concerns that happens with HUDs is that you have to focus in and out. It's pretty good. Uh, I have terrible eyesight and these are variable prescription. So it is hard for me to determine whether you don't have to shift your focus at all if you have 20-20 vision. But for me, just a, it's a slight focus shift and I didn't really get to see it that much once the sun came out. It's kind of washed out by the sunlight. In the limited, you get a full panoramic glass roof with a sunshade. That sunshade takes about five to six seconds to close, which is very reasonable. Unlike say the ID4, where you basically had time to go get a cup of coffee before it finished closing. So you also get all the kind of standard Hyundai safety features that you would expect. You've got blind spot collision avoidance, parking distance monitors, parking collision avoidance, lane keep assist, lane follow speed limit assistance, blind spot camera surround view, which comes up only in the limited model. And you also get highway lane changes where the car will make the lane change for you. This is a system where you need to keep your hands on the steering wheel. In the middle here, you have a movable center console. And in the back, we'll have a look at this in a second. You have an outlet that you can use, which allows you to draw up to 1.9 kilowatts. That is only in the limited model. In the other models, that comes as an optional extra, which you plug in on the outside to do your vehicle to load. As with many other vehicles available now, you can set your phone up to be your key, thus avoiding the need to carry a key around with you. Just be aware though, that if you are in an area with no signal, you only get 15 locks and unlocks before the car will essentially lock you out. It does still have a physical key, which is always nice if you, well, 
have an issue where the 12 volt auxiliary battery dies. It also has cruise control with machine learning, so it apparently will learn from your driving style. It'll learn things like how close you like to follow and where you like to be positioned on the road. It has an eight speaker Bose sound system, at least it certainly does in this trim level. It also has a two spoke steering wheel. I do like two spoke steering wheels, although this bulbous section in the middle, I'm not quite so fond of. And perhaps the final thing we should talk about, what we're starting to see now with EVs is that they are starting to be rated for towing and the Ionic 5 is no exception. It can tow 2,000 pounds braked or 1,650 pounds of unbraked trailer. And that is really handy. I mean, this is a very useful, usable space inside, but adding that trailer capacity is gonna make this a car that is much more flexible for Certainly people like me who like towing things. Okay, that is enough of me rambling about specs. Let's get back on the road. So both when Nikki drove the ID4 and when Winter drove the slightly more performance oriented ID4, people were upset because we said that it doesn't love to go fast. And I'm gonna be honest, the Hyundai Ionic 5 doesn't make me want to drive fast. I mean, I want to drive fast anyway. I'm that kind of a person. I like to say I have a heavy right foot and it doesn't beg to be driven that way. And that's fine because that's not what it's for. However, it will do it and it will do it without complaining. And it is a lot of fun. Although I would say that because I was brought up to believe that if you can't have fun driving a Yugo 45, you're doing driving wrong. So you can throw it into corners and it will take them and it will hold the road really very well. It has a little bit more body roll than I would like, but really what you get is all those benefits of an EV drivetrain and really a very modern platform. The amount of cabin space you get is very generous. It feels very luxurious, not luxury. It's definitely not quite luxury, but it is extremely quiet. And compared to its predecessor, the Kona, it is a whole step change away. It is just so much quieter. And I have to say, I actually really like this car much more inside and much more to drive than I really expected to. I really thought that the EV6 would be more my kin. You know, it's a much more sporty vehicle, so I'm told. But the Ionic does what it does really, really well. If you're gonna sit on the freeway a lot, if you're gonna do a lot of long distances, I can see this car just eating that up. It will just, go and driving down the highway with the highway assist it wasn't blue cruise level but it was certainly very good i know you're gonna ask because zero to 65 seconds let's quickly switch into sport mode so you get a torque display okay bury the pedal okay bye bye to all the camera gear and that's 60. so it is fast. It is reasonably quick. So that zero to 60 time is apparently five point something seconds, which as someone pointed out to me earlier when I was parked is not Tesla fast, but it's not meant to be. That is enough. It is more than enough. And it will certainly allow you to keep up with traffic. It will certainly get you out of trouble. And it's enough to have quite a lot of fun with. Like I say, a little bit more body roll in these corners than you might like, but not too much. And certainly, again, this is not the car to buy if you are going to go and throw it down back lanes every weekend. You're picking the wrong horse. This is the car to buy to do long distance driving in. This is the car that you buy if you do you live in the Midwest and you're five hours outside of the, mo the nearest city. It will take those kinds of journeys and it will do them with ease. 
one of the touches that I've found really fun. When you look at the Hyundai Concepts, they've been using Nixie tubes, which if you don't know what they are, they're the kind of little glowy numbers based on basically a valve. So technology from the 50s and 60s. And they use those in their concept vehicles. And they've actually brought that in, in the design of the infotainment system, which in the radio has some Nixie Tube-like numbers displayed on Nixie Tube-like items. Nixie Tubes. Well, they're not really Nixie Tubes, but they're kind of Nixie Tube-esque, which is very, very sweet. And just kind of emphasizes that thing that I said earlier. I didn't really believe that Hyundai would build this car, and yet here I am driving it. On the steering wheel here, you have capacitive looking buttons, but they are not capacitive. So thank you, Hyundai, for that. Although I did spend several minutes going, why is it not doing anything when I'm pressing it or when I'm tapping it? These are actually tactile buttons which look capacitive, which is an odd decision, but I think it works quite well. Uh, if you just do that, nothing happens. If you do that, then you get the desired effect. And actually, this touchscreen and this infotainment system is extremely quick to start. We've tried some other vehicles recently where the system takes a very long time to boot up. This is not one of those. This starts pretty much as quick as the car does, and it is only a few seconds from powering on the car to being ready to go, which is very important. So down here, you have the climate control buttons, these are capacitive. I'm not really sure why they made that decision. It doesn't really add to the experience, and as far as I can tell, unlike the EV6, which obviously is also based on the EGMP platform, these don't change, they're just here, and you have to look down to be like, I want the screen defrost. It's not divided up in any way that would allow you to find the buttons without actually looking. So one of the most interesting things about the EGMP platform is that it has a dual 400 and 800 volt architecture, which it can switch depending on what it's doing. So if it's needed for charging, it can charge at 800 volts, or it can charge at 400 volts, which allows it to use older legacy hardware. I say legacy hardware, that is what most chargers are at this point, but there are a lot of newer 800 volt chargers out there. And so using one of those 350 kilowatt 800 volt chargers, it will charge from 10 to 80% in just 18 minutes, which is just enough time to have a pee and go get a soda and get back in the car. That is the kind of change to charging, which I think is really transformative because it means that people who are used to driving a gas car will have the same kind of experience when they're road tripping in an EV, unlike older models, which take somewhat longer to charge, which is perfectly reasonable, we found. So we drive to Las Vegas every year in a car that charges at 50 kilowatts, and it is a little tedious, but it is definitely doable. And for the number of times of the year that we do it, that's fine. But range, anxiety, and charging are two of the things that people often cite as problems, and this overcomes one of those. In fact, in the rear-wheel drive with 300 miles of range, it overcomes them both, pretty much. The navigation system does have one significant flaw, which is that it does not automatically add intelligent charging stops. Now, Hyundai have said that's something that they're working on, and they do have the information to do it, but how they're going to implement it, I don't know. And at the moment, you are still relegated to using something like a better route planner, which is excellent, but is a third-party solution for long-distance driving. And that I find really disappointing. They've had such a lot of time to update this that they haven't taken that step that is really vital, especially since they themselves cited charging as one of the important factors in people's desire or lack of desire to adopt EVs. Using an 800 volt charger or an, any Electrify America charger should be very simple because the car does come equipped with plug and charge, or at least so I'm told. I was hoping to get a demonstration of the 800 volt charging today. Unfortunately, 
I have slightly misjudged my timing and so I'm not going to get to see that but I know that there have been lots of reviews which have indicated that the 800 volt charging is pretty much as quick as they say it is. Because the navigation system does not automatically identify chargers that means that the Ionic 5 doesn't preheat for charging. It doesn't precondition its batteries which is something that Tesla does and that is a real downside if you're going to live somewhere cold and do a lot of road tripping because you're going to find your charging is going to be impacted by that. How much of an effect that'll have I can't say at this point but my experience from other EVs is that not having the ability to precondition on the way to the charger can make your charging time substantially longer. Now because you're throwing 800 volts and 350 kilowatts into the battery it will probably warm up and it will probably stay warm once you've done a few charges in a day you'll probably find that it is less of an issue but that first charge from a cold battery I suspect will take substantially longer than the time that is kind of the best case scenario. One thing that slightly bugs me the one pedal driving appears to be something that I keep having to set. It may be that it's possible, you know, this is a, a first drive. So let me remind you, I've had this car for maybe four hours so far today. That includes all the time to set up and film. So uh, there's not a lot of time to, you know, investigate the menu system and have a little play with the eight speaker Bose surround system you just you don't you don't have time for that but the iPedal one pedal driving every time I've got in the car and restarted it I've had to reset that and I don't really want that to be something that I reset like it's like the auto hold I want auto hold and I want one pedal driving I want it to apply the brakes when I'm at a stop and I want it to do one pedal driving. The one pedal driving is excellent. I have no complaints about the one pedal driving once it's engaged. My complaint is that I don't want to have to individually engage it. I do want to do these curves much faster. So what are my final thoughts on the Ionic 5? I mean final for a first drive. It is a real step change. I mean this car you just feel like it was designed to be an EV. You have a big flat floor in here, you have so much space, it feels so much bigger and yet outside it's not that much bigger. It handles really respectably. It is like I say not the sportiest car but it's certainly manages itself on twisty lanes in a very reasonable way. And the thing I would say is that it has been incredibly popular. Like the Mach-E, when we've taken that out for test drives, people stop you, people interrupt filming to tell you how interested they are in the car. And that has happened so many times today. Wherever I've stopped, people have asked questions and not just one, like three or four or five different groups of people have come up to ask about the car. And that tells me that Hyundai have really hit the mark with this one. I feel like I want to be more critical of it. I certainly think they should have put in preconditioning for the battery. I certainly think that the navigation system really should include automated charging stops for long drives. But you know what? In terms of the styling, the interior cabin, I think they've really pretty much hit the mark perfectly. This is a really good car. That's it for today. Thanks for joining me. And you know what? If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. You can support us by doing that. It helps the algorithm know that you like our stuff and then it gets shared more. If you would like to support the channel, you can do that on Patreon, Bitcoin, or through Ko-fi, 
all of those methods really help us do what we're doing now. And they also support our editor, who had to watch 700 takes of me doing this because I don't have my teleprompter. Thanks to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month patrons. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, Jason Bondor, Brian Newton, Michael Goad, David Janakula, Ricky Leong, Andrew Martin, Guido Drahota, Brophy Wolf, Tesla in the Gong, Joseph Broucher, Sean Ueda, Gordon C, Ray Jean Fellows, Anonymous Freak, Jim Burness, Anthony Coates, Kyle Hodgson, Laura Sanborn, Rory Litwin, and Denny Hyde. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month patron supporters, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Joe Bresney, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, Matthew Drobnak, Christopher Lee Jones, Paul Conway, Ellery Hensley, and Ian. If you're feeling left out, you can join our Patreon and have your name added to that list. You can also support us through Bitcoin, Ko-fi, or our swag store. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving. What? I, I didn't record the two versions thing? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll get right on it.